Hello, everyone. Happy Friday. Thanks for being here. Uh, admitting people, great to see everyone here on this wonderful Friday. Got a random call calling me. So thank you so much for being here. Ken, good to see you. Charlie, Brandy, Alex Gorsex driving back from Indianapolis. Alice Rodriguez, welcome. Brent Hoven, welcome. Dan Finkel, welcome. Great to see you all here. This is exciting to be diving into all things TAC. Uh, got some really awesome speakers for you here today. And so I ask uh, everyone just to uh, wait a minute. We're going to get started here in just a minute or two. Um, but again, maybe if, in the meantime, if you want to put in the chat, uh, where are you calling from? And and uh, and who are you? Um, what's your name? Um, you can uh, even put one word that describes TAC to you. Um, so maybe where are you calling from? And TAC in one word to you would be wonderful. Um, just to kind of fire up the chat here a little bit. Great to see 44, 45 people here, which is awesome. We had over 100 people sign up, which is fantastic. It kind of shows to me the importance and relevance of all things TAC. So again, thank you again for, for being here. So I see a couple of people. John, thanks for leading us off here. Uh, the Woodlands, Texas, Kenny, East Tennessee. Perfect. So fired off. Um, and we'll get started here in just a minute. But just to kind of set some ground rules for everyone, the point of this whole event is really to be a community-driven, knowledge-sharing, information-sharing, learning uh, best practices from each other. Um, TAC is something that we're going to dive into uh, very in-depth here today, um, talking about who, what, when, where, why, all things TAC. But kind of the format of this event is I'm doing the intro now. All the speakers are going to give a quick little 30-second intro, and then they're each going to give about a five to 10-minute presentation about TAC and their perspective. And then it's going to open up to a roundtable, open Q&A. If you got a question, ask it. If you've got a comment, drop it. But when that part comes out, please don't try and uh, hog the mic. You know, we want everyone to participate and talk. Having said that, try and limit your comments to maybe about 60 to 90 seconds. And then we want Paul and AJ and Greg, our speakers, to give some context. But this event is for you, by you, to really be community driven. So Without further ado, I'm going to share my screen really quick on one uh, thing that's kind of driving what we're doing and why we're here. Um, but so this is around all things TAC, and this event is made possible by the community members and some of the key logos you see on here. So this is being hosted today by Smart Firefighting. Um, but if you're all familiar with the Civ TAC event that's happening October 1st and 3rd, by the one and only Ken Rabin, who's in the crowd here, who will be talking. Um, definitely suggest and recommend that you pull up your phone and scan that. This is something that is, again, an in-person event to continue the fun that we're talking about here. Um, and special shout out as well to the Red Lab from Indiana, uh, formerly known as Crisis Technology Innovation Lab. They're kind of evolving to be this uh, Swiss army knife of all things tech and building relationships to be able to help fund entrepreneurs and first responders and bring them together to drive innovation. So Red Lab is going to be a continued, very important piece of the puzzle around all things tax. So excited for you all to see that. So definitely make sure, scan that and be aware and reach out to Ken. And I'll stop sharing there for a second. Um, and kind of to start us off here, I think we all know what we're here today is to talk about TAC and the impact on public safety, a little bit of the who, what, when, where, why. Um, TAC is short for, uh, long for the team awareness kit. So it's a suite of tools that we all know it's designed to improve situational awareness and operational efficiency in public safety. And these speakers here today are going to explore the origins and the development of TAC and how it's become a key tool in emergency response. Um, we're going to talk into how TAC compares to other tools, how it benefits public safety and share some really practical use cases for all of you. Um, so we got Greg Albrecht here, Paul Clifton, AJ Johansson, three just OGs in the tax space that I'm excited to learn from. So I'll shut up here in a second. Um, but I encourage you all to ask questions in the chat. Think of stuff to talk about here in a second. So now I'm going to ask um, all the speakers to give a quick little intro in their order. So we'll go AJ, Greg, Paul, quick 30 second intros. And then we're going to go into your presentations, followed by the opening um, open Q&A. So um, AJ, Greg, Paul, quick interest from all of you. Hey, thanks, Kevin. My name is Andreas Johansson. Most folks know me as AJ, a fire captain paramedic for the Corona Fire Department in Southern California. A little over 30 years in the fire service going across uh, federal, state, and local government. I've been using TAC for the last uh, six years and like to evangelize and uh, share information about it. 
Thanks, AJ. Hey, uh, everyone, it's Greg Albrecht here. Uh, I'm a uh, EMT here in San Francisco, also an EMS supervisor for a lot of special events and uh, things of that nature in the city. Uh, I've been using TAC for a couple of years, and and this what I like about it is it solves a lot of the problems that we experience out in the field, and the benefit is that I can use it myself, and it's easy to adapt to. Um, and I just like solving problems for folks in this space and, and, and being able to do that for myself as well. So I'm glad to be here. And Paul? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Paul Fletcher. I'm the uh, search and rescue coordinator and deputy with the Kentucky County Sheriff's Office. I've been using TAC for about five years, uh, uh, learning and uh, riding on the coattails with Greg and AJ. And uh, I love TAC because it, uh, allows us to get what we need when we need it uh, in a timely fashion and uh, and uh, streamline our operations and events. So glad to be here. Right on. Thanks, Paul. So as you know, we got these three featured speakers going to jump into presentations right now, starting with AJ. I ask you to keep your, your camera can be on now or later, but please stay on mute until you're speaking later um, just to prevent any disruptance. So um, we're going to go AJ, followed by Greg, then Paul, and uh, fire up the chat with questions, comments, and then uh, we'll continue to fire off. So AJ, I'm going to spotlight you for everyone. So you're going to become big here. And then uh -huh. uh, free to uh, share your screen. And AJ, uh, you know, six to 10 minutes, floor is yours. All right. You see the main presentation? I do. It's the, um, I see kind of the full screen. Uh, I think mm. if you want to maybe use the slideshow, I think. What if I swap display? Yep, that's perfect. that's perfect. All right. It's not. I don't want to look to the left that much. It's a little backwards for me. But so you know, I wanted to talk about uh, the, you know the why why tack why you know, why I'm so passionate about it. Um, like I said before, I've been the fire service about thirty years. Been poking around technology the last uh, half of it, and um, you know I've seen technology come and go. I've seen the stuff that stick. I've seen a lot of promises and then those promises kind of fade away and, and don't materialize into much. And so I've been with TAC for six years, I said, and it stuck with me and it just keeps getting better and better. Always from learning folks, uh, from learning from folks like Paul and and then did, and Greg and the development they've done. Um, so the argument for why TAC for me revolves around two things. First, it's a universal platform. And second, it's open uh, to build on. And I'll expand on on both of those things. So first, that that universal uh, platform. Um, you know, although TAC was originally designed for the military for what they call you know friendly force identification, where are my friendlies and target correlation to make sure that um, we're not targeting our friendlies and we're not mixing up you know those folks on the battlefield. Um, it's great that it you know these tools that are in it aren't spe mission specific so it's you know what we see a lot and i see in, in public safety is this tool was built for you know structural firefighting or this is for a wildland firefighting or this is a search and rescue tool or this is for a specific law enforcement thing what i love mm -hmm. about about tac is that all these tools at the core are universal across all, all missions and I've seen that. I was like, man, it'd be nice to have that one thing in that one application in this other application. But TAC has that all uh, across, um, you know, across the board. So, the, you know, we've got this extremely robust code base that has all these amazing tools and these universal things. Um, the bottom line is that we all want situational awareness. It's ubiquitous across, you know, all, all missions. And what was originally designed for the warfighter has been adapted to the crime fighter and firefighter really well because we're all after we're all after that kind of same core information. Um, so these basics are, you know, seeing where our team members are, sending a location of interest between members, you know, attaching photos and text details to give more context to these locations. It's got a host of, you know, drawing tools, measuring tools, navigation, chat messaging, and like I said, all of this stuff is universal, um, you know, between incidents. It doesn't matter if you're on any in, any type of incident. All this stuff is powerful. So as you look at this diagram, you can see that TAC can fit in anywhere from a search and rescue to a wildfire, swift water rescue, law enforcement, manhunt. It can incorporate sensors from um, manned aircraft, you know, uncrewed aircraft, so on and so forth. 
So now I want to go on to my second part um, and about the TAC as an open foundation. So it's an open foundation uh, to build upon. Um, you know, what do I what do I mean by that? I mentioned before that, you know, you can drop a point on a map and share it um, with your other team members. The cool thing about TAC being open is that a lot of times symbols mean something. So a marker has some sort of symbology reference to it. Just as a, a real rudimentary um, example of TAC being open is that you can make your bringing your own symbology sets right into TAC. It was built from that to start and then share that across the team. And now we're all using these same um, symbol sets. And we've done that with Wildfire, bringing in the GeoOps. We started on our own and now it's part of the core. So if you have a specific symbol set, you can bring that in. Now, let's say you need more functionality. You know, TAC was built on this idea of plugin architecture, which allows developers to build in specific functionalities that TAC doesn't have. It could be a capability that you need TAC to do. It could be a hardware, like a certain radio, like a Beartooth or somewhere labs. It allows you to interact with that hardware through TAC. As, as an example, you know, for some functionality, um, the way TAC does tracking of tracks is not the way we do it in wildfire. We're used to going out and, and hiking around a wildfire. And the way you did it in TAC, because it was you know built for the military, was a little clunky. And so the state of Colorado hired a developer. They built what's called, it's on the Play Store now, called the, um, the wildfire survey tool. And now you can go out and map a fire the way we, we're used to doing it. So just an example of plug-in architecture. And there's over 100 different plugins available now. So this ability to build on top of this base through plugin architecture, architecture makes TAC unlike any of the other products um, out there for tactical mapping and collaboration. There's nobody asked permission for. Um, it's open for development. You can do it yourself, hire a developer and just go. It's not you going to um, a business and saying, can you do this? And then going back to the board, you know, bringing up a level of effort, trying to figure out you know, hey, is there need? How much can we sell this for? So on and so forth. You can just build it and go. And then you can share it. And last, I call it that all roads lead back to TAC. Um, I've looked at a lot of software over the years. And there are some niche software like that are good. Like in my agency, we use Tablet Command. Tablet Command is a great software for integrating with our CAD and light mapping and getting us to the call and really great for resource management, who's in what division. I think it's great for that. Um, and the back of our battalion chief vehicles have a TAC tablet and, a, and an iPad running tablet command, and they work side by side. You know, one is not the other. So for tactical mapping, you know, it, TAC is really where it's at. And these two core things really bring me back that the ability for these core functions and the be able to build on and now my mantra is, if not TAC, then what? I'm waiting for someone to show me something, something better at that tactical level application that's so robust. So that's it for me. If not TAC, then what? I love that, AJ. I think we need to make that into a shirt, if not by a SIF TAC. Yeah. Wow. So this is good. Remember to continue to fire up the chat with questions. I saw one in there and we'll get to that in a bit here. So next we're going to throw it over to Greg. Greg, floor is yours. I'm going to spotlight you. Your face will get big. And... Oh gosh. <laughs> Hi, Greg. Hi, uh, y'all. Cool. All right. Let me uh, share my presentation here. Uh, okay. All right. I'm going to share. And then I'm going to go to slideshow. And Kevin, is there, are you seeing the slideshow yep. or the presentation view? Presentation, perfect. Yeah, oh my gosh, I nailed it. Okay, all right, hey everyone, Greg Albrecht here. Uh, I'll reintroduce myself real quick. So uh, I'm uh, Greg Albrecht, I'm a public safety technologist, uh, tax me and EMT. So technologist is, I you know, I try to, try to take technology and solve problems for public safety, right? That's the biggest thing, but it's not just technology, it's um, technical advising, uh, for agencies, especially um, uh, when it concerns special events, uh, concerts, festivals, parades, inaugurations, things of that nature. Um, and then I also provide TAC integration support, and I'm still licensed EMT here in San Francisco. I'm also a HAM, W2GMD is my call sign. So I have a background in both the communications and technology side and the emergency response side. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the TAC, define a couple of terms, 
and talk about the motivation, uh, why we think TAC is an important solution in this space, and of course, some of the challenges that come along with that. So to, to clarify some terms, uh, when you start exploring TAC, when you become TAC curious, um, you're gonna run into a bunch of different words. So I wanna clarify, um, ATAC is the original, ATAC's the OG. Um, I won't say it was the original app in this space, but like it was the first thing a lot of us became familiar with was ATAC, uh, Android Team Awareness Kit. On the DoD side or on the defense side, they refer to it as the Android Tactical Assault Kit. Um, for Windows, there is the WinTAC, the Windows Tactical Assault Kit, or the Windows Team Awareness Kit. And then um, uh, ITAC is the iOS version, creative name, right? Uh, TAC Product Center is the organization under DOD that manages the TAC uh, ecosystem. And then when we say TAC product, we mean ITAC, WinTAC, ATAC, whatever. Uh, for simplicity's sake, we're just going to say TAC. And when I say TAC, I just mean stuff in the TAC ecosystem. I'm not referring to a specific application. I just mean something that ties into TAC. Oh, my thing there. So uh, to define situational awareness, right? It's, it's, um, it's not a term that we use on the street all of the time, but it's something we experience in the street all the time, right? What's going on around me? You know, what are my resources? Where are my resources? And what are my hazards, right? You know, these are sort of the, the first things you try to assess when you get on scene with an incident, right? What's happening? Um, where's my backup? Um, what kind of backup am I getting? And, you know, what what's the danger here? What's what's inside the box that are that's my hazards? And I like to scope it for within three questions, right? When I get on scene, what's happening? Uh, what happened and what's going to happen, right? Well, it's the history leading up to the incident. What's the current situation? And what do I anticipate happening next? Or what does the scenario anticipate is going to happen next? Those are the three situational awareness questions I try to assess when I'm when I'm on scene. Uh, why, why TAC? Why, why develop it? Why throw any effort at this at all, right? Um, for starters, it's to reduce human factors errors, right? The motivation leading to development of TAC within the DOD was from a fratricide event in Afghanistan, right? Uh, one among many. And a lot of those came back to human factors errors, right? Not that there was anything necessarily wrong with the people, but they weren't provided with the data and the information that they needed to make safe decisions. Um, also to align with the national defense strategy around data and data sharing. And then CFSC, right? We want to move from government off the shelf to um, certified for secure, right? We want commercial off the shelf equipment to be able to meet the needs of these high security scenarios. And that gives us a twofold effect, right? One is cost savings, right? We don't need to get, you know, if everyone remembers the Obama Blackberry, right? That was not a cheap device, right? But if we can get something from Samsung off the shelf that has the same capabilities, that's going to save the taxpayer in the long run. And uh, the, 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 the second factor there is that um, it secures our supply chain, right? Like if I can let Samsung stand up or Samsung or any of the other vendors, right? I'm just using them as an example. But if I can use Samsung to establish that supply chain, then I don't need to be reliant on one organization or one SI to build me that Obama BlackBerry. I can just go get it from a commercial off the shelf and it meets all of my security needs. So that's what I mean by moving from government off the shelf to commercial off the shelf. It should just work. Uh, we wanna solve one problem, right? One problem at a time. Where are the good guys? Where are the bad guys? Where's the victim and where's the shooter? Where's, my, where's the engine and where's the truck, right? Where's the spot fire and where's my, uh, my closest strike team? right? That's one problem at a time that we can solve in this interface. Um, overall, it was to be the model for open source within the Department of Defense, right? You know, when we think of those users, we don't necessarily think of them doing things in the open. So when AFRL developed TAC, it was really to um, push the limits on what the model for open source could be within DOD. And then as Joe said, start simple, get fancy, right? We're neutral to what you use it for. Uh, we give you the simplest interface, a dot on a map, and then you can get fancy from there. And the last part is, you know, reduce the total cost of ownership, right? What is the return on investment from us choosing to go with TAC, right? Are we going to, is this going to cost us more later because we're siloing our data or are we making everything open and available? And then last, you know, 
by by making it available to everyone, by being able to integrate with everything, by being able to tie in and interoperate with everyone, we're going to lift the tide for all the boats. And then, of course, there's the challenges um, that we have to, to solve for, right? Uh, we have limited spectrum, right? How are we going to get that data across? Where are we going to get it to? What's the What are the bandwidth constraints? Things of that nature. Uh, what is our context awareness, right? Is using something like this, is using an application or a tool like TAC, um, going to change our contextual awareness, right? Are we going to have to uh, context switch? Um, if you're familiar with the concept of flow, once you get into a good flow, when you're getting something done, switching out of that flow is really expensive. And so I think that is a cost to consider when you're when you're assessing a tool like this is, you know, is this going to disrupt your flow or your operator's flow or your responder's flow? Um, does it require line of sight, right? Are there constraints around what we can pass back and forth if we're using a tool like this? Um, are there legacy things that we need to consider, right? Are we uh, are we green screening? I remember I went to the Toyota dealer one time and they had these fancy tablets, these GTAC tablets. I'm like, that's so cool. They're so modern. They can just come out and scan the barcode on the car. Well, it turns out it's just a green screen to some mainframe on the back end, right? They're just pulling, you know, it's basically a DOS prompt on their window. So, you know, we have to consider that too. Are there legacy things that we need to tie to or maintain uh, when we when we pull in TAC? Uh, position, navigation, and timing, right? Uh, are there constraints on that? Are we going to be working in garages? Um, or do we need to pull in uh, intelligence information, ISR, uh, camera feeds, sensor feeds, recon you know, um, downrange um, uh, reconnaissance, things of that nature? Are those things that we need to consider? How do we pull that in and how do we make that accessible within the tech ecosystem? And how quickly can we do it? Does this increase our speed? Does this decrease our speed? What is our tempo? And how can we close the, the OTA loop on our operations? So I just wanted to lay those out there as sort of areas to think about when you're considering, considering TAC in your ecosystem. Back to you, Kevin. Thanks, Greg. Great, great outline and laying out everything there. So next, we're going to throw it to Paul Clifton to be our final speaker. And then we're going to open up the crowd. So if you got questions, start thinking of them. Um, so final presentation here to, to fire us off. Paul, I'm going to spotlight you. So you are going to get big here as well, um, as well as sharing your screen. Thank you. So Paul, the I see your web screen. Or So floor is yours. And if you got any questions, let me know. Appreciate it. Uh, glad to be here and uh, uh, honored to be here alongside AJ and Greg. And uh, um, I think for my portion of this presentation, uh, I'm going to attempt to uh, uh, show some practical, uh, like from experience, uh, what, what AJ and Greg are talking about. And just keep in mind, uh, you know, this is our use case uh, that we can probably extrapolate it to a deal with a fire agency or some or so forth or other use cases. But it's just uh, a small example of what uh, Greg and AJ have been saying. And, um, and so I'll... Uh, I'll jump right in. And again, it's it's our experience. And one thing I want to uh, um, mention, uh, you know, Greg um, made the point of start small. Um, I, I really want to emphasize that uh, in this presentation because, uh, you know, solve one problem at a time. So, you know, where are you? Where are your teammates? Or maybe where's the bad guy or the fire? Um, and then work from there because uh, um, I, I don't want this presentation to turn uh, turn into something that it's uh, uh, mislead anyone saying, oh, this is a uh, very simple. We started very small, a little bit of, of a background. Um, you know, I mentioned I'm a search and rescue coordinator uh, with the Copenhagen County uh, Sheriff's Office. So we primarily use it in search and rescue. But that being said, uh, we do have uh, applications in patrol and um, uh, particularly with canines uh, in use with drones, uh, as well as uh, wildland fire when uh, we were conducting evacuations. Um, so, um, you know, this being about why TAC, um, one of, in addition to what, uh, Greg and AJ, um, discussed, uh, this is just an area of our, uh, example, our area of operations, second largest county, uh, in the United States, 18,600 square miles. We could be running simultaneous search and rescue operations on one end of the county. So we stretch from just north of you know, uh, Sedona, if you're familiar with that, all the way to the Utah border. And a lot of our areas do not have cell phone coverage. 
And that, that, that's a huge uh, thing for us because we still want that situational awareness, personal accountability, and TAP allows us to do that because it's a network uh, agnostic. And I'll mention, I'll give examples of that in a, in a little bit. You know, it's just a little bit of background. We started in uh, 2019 before TAP went open source, meaning uh, the code was available to everybody before you couldn't get it at the uh, Play Store like you can now or ITAC at the, at the App Store in that case. Uh, so uh, we started small and we just just wanted to see where we were on a map. Uh, that was in about 2019 and we slowly built from there. We didn't have a tax server. Um, uh, those of you who know that's one major potential component of a tax ecosystem. You don't have to have one, but we, we didn't. Uh, then we slowly added it and we were running uh, Raspberry Pis out of our, uh, uh, running our small single board computers, uh, running them out of our trucks just to test it. And I want to thank my uh, sergeant and we had a key group of rescuers who happened to be Android users as well. So at that time, my attack was not available. And uh, uh, we were slowly uh, just uh, working, uh, testing it and, and trying to solve problems, uh, particularly starting off with, uh, as Greg mentioned, you know, where are you? Uh, uh, somebody mentioned in a previous uh, podcast that uh, one of the biggest things you notice is the radio traffic just drops. You're not asking where each other are or anything like that. You see it on a map and uh, then your radio traffic is focused on the topic or issue at hand or the problem to solve. Um, so uh, as we progressed, we did add a, a, a server in the cloud and uh, we started building um, an offline capability, meaning, uh, you know, when we first tested, we just used cell phone service where we could get it. And uh, in a lot of places, uh, we uh, were not, and we noticed a big difference in the operation. So that that led us to our next step. Um, um, and this, uh, and I have to give credit to Greg for this. It's just a huge um, uh, capability uh, gain for us. And he, he put something together called uh, uh, inter intercot uh, Greg, sorry if I butchered it, but um, this allowed us to uh, take our team in reach, uh, Garmin in reaches as you know, satellite emergency notification devices and share it and, and feed it to tap our TAC server. And then it could go out to people who, um, you know, uh, maybe maybe command staff or the coordinator who, who had cell phone service. So this really allowed us to um, really allowed us to, uh, you know, sort of build on that pace uh, communications, of, you know, plan, you know, primary, alternate uh, uh, contingency and emergency. And, uh, and you know, not too far away is where, uh, you know, why personnel accountability is a huge uh, issue for us is uh, it, it's, not, it's not the next county where we had, uh, we had uh, the Granite Mountain hotshots uh, get, get swept in a fire. And I did have kind of a personal experience with that in a recent fire that we had up in Northern Arizona where one side of the highway didn't have TAC or fire departments and some deputies and the radio traffic was chaotic, whereas our search and rescue personnel who were using images and, and TAC in case of cell phone service, uh, we, we had much higher confidence that all of our personnel were, were accounted for. Um, so th this was sort of that first progression of, uh, you know, um, using non-cell phone means of uh, communicating and uh, transmitting data. Uh, and then uh, recently we just uh, changed it. Uh, we just, we went to some of our labs and that allowed us to not only uh, kind of achieve that same capability with better messaging, uh, but it allowed us to track and see people who were not on the TAC platform. So if someone had the somewhere app, um, we could still track each other and, and see each other and message each other. So uh, again, enhancing that uh, personnel uh, accountability. And in, in our case, one of the things that we're building on to touch upon uh, uh, AJ's comment about the open foundation is we're using that to automate uh, communications log, uh, you know, ICS forms, uh, 
uh, like maintaining communication slides, we can do that through here. Uh, getting it on again about the uh, network, uh, TAC being um, network agnostic, it, you know, maybe maybe in some cases, particularly when we work, we have lots of canyons in our county. Uh, um, mesh networking is, is, is a great, great tool. We can track our personnel that way. They're down in canyon, they have no cell phone service. Sometimes satellite uh, service does not work well at all, especially if uh, the canyons are pretty like narrow slot canyons. Uh, we've switched to mesh radios. In our case, we used Gotenna, but AJ mentioned there too. So there are, uh, I believe somewhere now has uh, one as well. So that's the beauty of TAC. You can use which service best fits your need. It's, I'm not here to advocate one or the other, but whatever you decide, um, there's a good, it, there's a good chance it can work with TAC. Um, UAS integration. I, I think you know AJ AJ pointed, you know, touched on this fact, and uh, as did Greg. You know, there are a lot of services that that you know do a couple things really well, uh, but the problem is is getting that all together in a common operating picture. And in our case. Um, uh, you know, we're pulling from a lot of different uh, sources, which I, I, I'll mention, but in the case of drone um, operations, so we, we, excuse me, we work in uh, canyons. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, you know, fires in our county and, and uh, it, uh, terrain is constantly changing. We can use drones to generate current aerial imagery and get it out to our, our rescuers in, in the field. And this is just one example of a search in Canyon and uh, all the cameras that are high in the sky are actually uh, photos that the drone took. And I'll talk a little bit how we, about how we do that. Uh, we do a lot of uh, post-flight uh, post processing, but TAC is a great way for us to get information into the field and act on it as opposed to waiting till everyone comes back, start, you know, at the next planning meeting, and then we create the assignment the next morning, we can address some uh, um, urgent, uh, potential urgent uh, or new information immediately, as opposed to waiting till later. Uh, you know, with drones, uh, the, the beauty of this is, uh, uh, there's, especially in ATAC, there's a, a, a plugin called the UAS tool, and this is just one screenshot. The videos are much better, but I, you know, I'm not sure what the bandwidth is, so I just start to uh, screenshot too. But many times, you know, uh, we may have, and just think of your own use case. Perhaps, um, you know, a, a firefighter's calling, you know, a wildland firefighter's calling to their location, but you can't see them. Um, I know. Um, usually, they're TFRs, uh, so you're not using drones, but maybe you are. Um, but you can't see them, but with with uh, with the tax tool, not only can you see where your drone is on your map, everyone can see where the drone is uh, on the map. And I've actually used, uh, at the time when we needed waivers, uh, uh, identified this capability uh, with the FAA to mitigate flight over people, uh, over our own people who are non-participants. And, but also in the, in the video feed, you can see at the bottom, right there, that uh, yellow skittle, if you will, that it's a, uh, uh, you can see the folks, uh, even if they're under a tree, you can't physically see them, uh, you know where they are in the video feed. So these are a couple of examples of, of where we take uh, drone flights and we're, we're looking for pixel detection and we use a software that says, oh, hey, I think we see something here, like on the right side, um, something is not normal. Uh, we're looking for clues and we can place it on a map and send it out to our users and uh, in off-grid type of situations and they can go out and in this case somebody found a cattle ear tag that was green in the shade uh, so again in the past this would have had to go to a planning meeting you know get, pull all this together after getting everyone's 214s and then you know we generate the new assignment we can act on that immediately and uh, there's a radio metric version. We found hot spots down in the canyon, someone fell. Are we able to get the location? We never could really see them until daylight, but we were able to identify the location and get, get folks to them. So, uh, some of the other things that Greg has uh, really helped us out with is, um, and, and it's available, uh, 
the ability to track aircraft in, in our case, Canyon country, where there are no ADS, you know, there's no flight radar, nobody's beating that in the middle of nowhere. Uh, we can we can track the ADSD uh, signals coming off the aircraft right away and and off grid and feed it to our attack users uh, and ourselves. And, like, and so I know where, exactly where the rescue helicopter is and uh, and so forth. A couple more examples of you know what we can feed into that. Uh, in our case, we get a lot of log line fire. We fly a lot of drones. It's nice to know when a TFR pops up, and uh, we have that automated going into attack to confirm that we are or are not inside the temporary flight restriction, um, oftentimes in our case from caused by fire. And lastly, uh, another huge thing about it, especially in the search and rescue world, uh, we, um, you know, you may interact with teams, in this case, Cal Topo, maybe some fire teams, uh, a lot of fire teams use that out in California. Um, you can still share information. You can still you don't have to make one team go to one over and over. You need team accounts and so forth. But again, touching on AJ's uh, open foundation, we can not only get data from CalTopo, but we can also send our locations to another team that may be using CalTopo. So um, those are just, I think, some examples from, from our experience. And again, I want to reiterate what, what Greg mentioned, you know, start small and slowly build on it. But what I love about TAC is, you know, your imaginations are limit. And uh, and there's a great community for it that folks help us out, folks like Greg and AJ and, and countless of other people um, are available to share their information. So that's what I have for my presentation. If, uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Kevin. Quick little snaps for our speakers there to shed some light, maybe some, uh, even feel free to throw out some emojis. Uh, that was awesome. I learned a lot. Thank you all very much. And now this is really what this is all about. We set the stage, who, what, when, where, why, tax, some use cases, some applications. Um, and frankly, we can't cover this all in the next 30 to 45 minutes, however long this goes. This is why we're going to be doing a monthly roundtable with different SMEs, talking and breaking down different nuances of TAC working with the IU Red Lab, um, CivTAC, and Smart Firefighting, kind of just driving these concepts forward. So um, use this time right now to be selfish, ask questions. But again, I uh, want to reiterate, please don't talk for more than 90 seconds. You know, we want to hear from you, but we want everyone to have the chance to talk. Um, and we want Paul and AJ, Greg, to kind of help give two cents. But all of you have something to say, too. Um, so the floor is officially open. Um, I want to kind of look at someone... Um, and ask who may want to ask a question or comment. I saw some good chatter in, in the chat from from Colin, from uh, from someone, uh, Colin, Kenny, a few of you. Um, and I know a lot of you have a lot to say. So um, would anyone like to volunteer themselves to ask a question to our speakers? Um, or um, I can fire it off too. But I'm looking, I, I see some people off, off camera, whether it's a uh, CCOA there, um, Alex Gorsuch or Dallas Sims or 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 Charlie. Um, CCOA, I see, I do see your name there. Michael New, Nick coming off. So if your camera's off, I'm kind of assuming you want to talk. So um, I see uh, Nick and Michael now as well. So um, when do you want to ask a question or drop your two cents to start us off? I see Charlie asked a question. I can answer that. Charlie, do you want to ask it? And then uh, we can throw it to Greg to answer it. Yeah, so getting new into TAC, uh, I run into a lot of guys that are migrating from whiteboard to tablet. And some of them are evaluating the incident command systems here at Ascent. Uh, our first integration going into TAC, I use TAC in, in my demos. But in the evaluation conversations, the end users are asking, you know, what kind of post-incident reporting capabilities do we have in TAC compared to other incident command software platforms that are available on the market? Yeah, I will say that that is a gap. Um, there is currently not a, you know, a, a off-the-shelf solution for that in TAC today. Um, the If you're using TAC infrastructure, like what uh, they refer to like the TAC server, it's got a way of archiving that data. So um, when your phone generates a message, attack 
event, right? Maybe a location information or PLI, and it sends that out. Uh, if you're using something like a tax server, there's an archive capability, but there's no back, there's no front end to that, right? It's just stored in a database somewhere. Now you need a database person that understands how to extract that. Um, this came up a couple of weeks ago where we had a critical incident where TAC was being used. Um, you know, there were questions around why why did it take them so long to get there's always everyone always wants to know why it took them so long to get there but why did it take them so long to get there what route did they take etc we weren't saving that we were treating that data as ephemeral like it was gone but it was in that instance that we realized well we need a way of analyzing this for after action reports um and more importantly this was a multi-day event so if we're staging ambulances in a spot and that's not a good spot to stage ambulances in. That would be good to know the next day. And being able to pull up that data and analyze that data and get a report on that would be super important in that in that event. Uh, that doesn't exist today. Uh, a tool like that would be great in this space. And you can do a little bit, Charlie. I mean, if, if you wanted just for some real quick, you know, query tracks where someone was at, the tax server does save that. But it's not in like give me like you something you'd get out of CAD, you know, like traditional CAD system. Like you can go in and, and query track. If I wanted to know where's Greg been in the last, you know, hour or two, I can go into the TAC server and query that if he's had his TAC device on. Um, some other things I know that Paul's doing for some, even during an incident is generating a 214. Um, he's got a, a really unique tool. So that's great for SAR missions, wildfire, where we're typically asking people to document what they've done through the day, you know, organized wildfire, you know, type three team and, and above, not an obviously initial attack. So there are, there are some things, but as Greg said, it's not intelligent right now. And that is definitely got the attention of AFRL. Um, Greg's um, talked to them about, you know, doing a little bit more of uh, deep insight into prediction based on what has occurred. Yeah, I, I, I think, uh, uh, sorry, you're, you're right, and, and the other, and AJ and Greg uh, is right. There's no uh, front end, if you will, that makes that easy. Um, but uh, we've, you know, for us, uh, one of the benefits of TAC is that, you know, the first, the biggest part of that battle is, is the data there? Yes, it is there. Um, the next challenge is how do we uh, make it uh, user friendly? How do, how do we get to it easily? And use it quickly. And as AJ mentioned, um, you know, it's not only for search and rescue, but uh, you know, wildland fire evacuations when we're trying to document, uh, you know, which homes have been contacted and so forth. You know, it's we're, we're following the incident command structure. So we're starting small, trying to automate that. Uh, if you're using data sync, which is a plugin, it it really captures even more data. And so if you you, you know, it's all, almost like a social media app where you hashtag, you know, hashtag two fourteen and hashtag your team number. And uh, then, then once we can query that tax server and generate a PDF, the 214 form, same thing with the comms log. Um, and those are two small examples, And um, but there's definitely a gap there. And if, uh, if a lowly deputy is trying to figure that out, um, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure there are other folks uh, like yourself and like ourselves that uh, um, would like to see uh, improvement in that, but it's definitely doable to, to, to create that it's the data is there it's just time to build that funding. Dan I'll throw it to you and Charlie thanks for leading this off and when you start speaking give us 10 seconds to who you are what you're doing why you're here and then ask your question or drop your comment so Ken throw it to you yeah Ken Raven quick comments I so just want to follow up on Charlie's uh important question I Charlie I think you're probably talking to folks in the fire service on, in, on incident command uh, I've been evaluating a variety of software packages uh, for incident management on, on fire ground uh, AJ referred to one of them tablet command there's also a uh, dashi and SDI and these tools all have fairly significant auditing mechanisms for post action analysis and what I see is TAC is complementary to those tools. I don't think TAC completely replaces your incident management uh, framework in general, but I think it's an important input. And I think these tools should as well should output to TAC. And I've been trying to work with the vendors and encourage them 
to support COT, to find ways to interface with tech so that when an end user is at the edge of the operation, they're seeing a common operating picture, not necessarily what unit is assigned to what division, which is what those tools do, but what are the pin drops on the map? Where are the other folks who are collaborating with? Thank you. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to add on that, you know, because we run both. We run tablet command and tech. And if you've ever seen any of my presentations that I've recorded, I usually end with the silver bullet, my last slide. And I say tech is not a silver bullet. It's not going to solve all your use cases. And I think there's an argument for how much can you fit on one screen anyway? And so in the back of our battalion chief vehicles, when we're doing, you know, uh, it's a significant incident, you know, we have our tactical mapping application up, which is on a large Samsung Ultra tablet, which is TAC, and then the iPad Pro, which has got the divisions and groups and 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 what units are assigned. And it, it's really the, like like Ken said, they've complement each other. One is not the other one. Tablet Command is a light. I call it. It gets you to the call. It's a very light mapping application, and we are doing some stuff with Tablet Command. Greg built me a script that uh, Greg is taking Tablet Command or AVL out of Tablet Command and publishing it in our tax servers. So it, we are already doing um, some of that that work. Um, and anybody that that you know, I've had people say, well, why would I use TAC versus Tablet Command? Or even when we got Tablet Command, you know, certain people or organization. Well, now that we have Tablet Command, do we need TAC? And I was like, you need to learn both of these products better because you don't understand them well enough to know how different, you know, what purpose, uh, you know, purpose they serve. Well, I love them both. They're they're both great products. Good chatter here. And I want to keep this going around the round. Um, and I see various people's cameras off. I'm listening to Gabal and told uh, Michael now, Michael New, uh, I see your camera's off, so I'm going to throw it to you. Question, comment, what do you got? Yeah, I, I didn't have a specific question. I appreciate it, Kevin. Um, this is the first one of these calls that I've been on and find it fantastic. I'm definitely going to uh, catch every subsequent call. Um, I wanted to ask a question to Paul. So you mentioned, um, I think I caught Gotenna, and then you were talking about other hardware um, Raspberry Pi implementations, and I saw some chat about mesh, mesh tastic, mesh radios in general. What what's the experience like for um, sourcing, identifying, um, and working with vendors, and probably not official companies or you know people, maybe somebody like Greg who has this subject matter expertise, and evaluating and sourcing. Um, you know, tools and platforms that can be used in the field and sort of the situation you were describing. And thanks, I'll go off mic for that. Yeah, that's that's a good question. And, um, you know, uh, there, it, it varies, uh, but uh, some some are, are, are super awesome. And, you know, I've not worked with all of them, but, you know, in the case, in the case of, for example, Mesh, Mesh Radio, uh, Gotenna, uh, we ended up, with Gotenna because we needed uh, we needed UHF frequencies because we have mountains and trees and things like that. Uh, so we we got our FCC license to do that, and uh, they are great to work with on that. It's pretty straightforward. However, um, that may not be if you're in a congested area, you may not be able to get that license for that many data channels. So, uh, but those are like you know the alternative potentially is MeshTastic, where that's open source. It's kind of tack like. And there's a, a large group of people who uh, work and develop not only just the mestastic portion, but working that into uh, into the TAC realm. Um, so it, it really varies. I know from our standpoint, uh, when there's new hardware, new capabilities that come out, I, you know, one of the first questions I ask is, does it TAC? Um, you know, and and I think it, it also touches on the last question that was brought up about uh, you know you know software as well. Um, more and more, I think uh, we're seeing whether it's on the software side, and I hope to see more on the software side, but uh, definitely on the hardware side, um, uh, APIs that allow you where that information is published, and and there's somebody doing that work somewhere, and uh, it's not hard, hard to find. Uh, uh, so I, I would say it really varies, but uh, as far as having it, those vendors working with uh, with the um, 
TAC ecosystem. I, I, I really am not too involved with how that works for the TAC product center. There is a process for that. Um, I would probably refer it to another speaker on that, but there's a tremendous amount of support like on the, on the, on the front lines uh, uh, and some, some, um, some are, uh, some go after the TAC ecosystem more aggressively than others. Does that answer your question? And we're throwing a bunch of the links in the yeah, chat. Thank you. Appreciate that, Paul. Thanks. I, we're throwing, uh, AJ and I are throwing a bunch in there. AJ, go for it. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, TAC, um, you know, the, the great thing about TAC is that, and, and, and Paul and Greg both talked about it, is that it's kind of network agnostic, takes advantage of multicast. So, you know, you, and the biggest difference, you know, with a lot of these other, you know, um, software solutions that you see is they require internet to to maintain connectivity between peers. You have to go to the internet, you have to hit a server. And TAC at the beginning was developed without the server. It was actually, ATAC was first meant as a peer-to-peer -peer tool and TAC server came much later. So it was meant for operators to go down range, see themselves, the people most important to them, the folks their teammates, and then TAC server came later. So that is the, the beauty uh, of, of TAC is that, you know, multiple networks, um, and, and Paul kind of hit on it. And people ask me, why don't you use Gotenna? Because I'm in Southern California, and I work for a small local government, medium local government fire department. I could never get enough UHF or VHF frequencies to use, and I can't take those throughout the state, you know, the FCC you know, I, my, my frequencies and my lot of only that operate. If you understand how that works, your issue frequencies, you can operate in your area. So we're using uh, Beartooth, um, using 900 ISM. And we've been happy with that product. I don't say there's probably, there's not, there's more than one right way to do it. I could say there's probably a little, there's some wrong ways that you might want to consider, you know, like, or something to consider, but I, there's, there's more, multiple right ways to do, you know, this in the pace plan, Hey, what works for you? And I tell, I call it the ACE card. You know, we have primary, alternative, contingency, and emergency. I most people are probably not going to have three different methods beyond cell. You know, cell is their primary. But pick, I call it the ACE card. Pick one. You know, pick one one thing that you can use beyond cell to main connectivity between between your teams. If that's using somewhere labs or bare tooth or Mesh-tastic, or a Doodle Labs radio, or whatever it is. And, and just understand the limitations within those and understand what you're going to get out of it. Well said, AJ. I want to continue to throw it around, rapid fire. We'll probably go past the hour mark, maybe in there 10, 15 minutes after. So um, I see if you want to talk, it's good to raise your virtual hand. So um, Calgary, I, I don't know who you are, or, <laughs> but uh, please quick intro. Let's try uh, yeah, no, uh, uh, Chris Proud here. Uh, I'm actually with the Department of the Interior. Uh, AJ, good to, good to see you on camera. Thanks, everybody. Um, so the question I have is probably not something that's going to be quick answered here, maybe that for a future roundtable time. Uh, really interested in, in how within your departments and organizations you work with your leadership and management on introducing TAC. And then more importantly around that, um, how part two of that is how or what challenges did you experience in operationalizing it and how that would maybe modify operating procedures and, and the way you do business organizationally? Um, I, I see that as, as something that it's not just about the technology, it's how does the end user consume that? And then how do we, how do we help them understand what it is? I can answer that because believe me, when I said, first off, just coming to the fire department and saying, hey, uh, we're going to move to Android when 90% of the folks use iOS. And, you know, I actually have a, a video on my YouTube channel called, uh, you know, um, Android for iOS users. We started there. But where we started with, we first started with just the phone and, you know, and, and said, like, look, I just need you to have this device turned on. And it, we're going to take, we're going to do this crawl, walk, run, fly approach. And it was more from a command and control down. I just need you to have your dot on the map. We exposed them to all the training videos and content. If anybody wanted to go ahead, that was fine. But that was not the expectations. The expectations were you have this turned on, company officer has this phone with them at all times. You know, it's on the fire engine, but when you dismount, we want to know where you are. And then... 
what we did next was we I, I set what I thought was you know the MVPs. You know what did I want people to be able to do, and I didn't do it. If I, I I put together a presentation, I had every crew go through it, and I said, "Do you think you're capable of doing these things?" And at the end of it, they're like, "Yes, we can do that." And that's what we set as our kind of basic level of what folks can do. Can they drop a point on the map and send it? Can they do a chat message? Can they do some measuring? Can they open up a floor plan of a building? Those sort of things. And everyone was like, yeah, we can do that. And then that evolved to now it's part of our, if you want to promote to captain, there will be a promotional portion of, of ATAC. We've always done radio. Um, we've always done, you know, how to use the mobile data computer and dispatch, but now TAC is part of that. We So we took it very slowly and now it's to the point where it's become, you know, op operationalized. And we do have guidebooks. So I would say, and I mentioned earlier, start small, maybe in, in a certain team element. You know, if you're law enforcement, maybe in your SWAT or some smaller team. If you're in wildfire, maybe like pick two hotshot crews, you know, to start doing it. And then the, let that get that feedback. Instead of getting feedback from everybody, you get smaller feedback and then go kind of go from there. Uh, the one thing I'll add to that too is um, what love them or hate them. Sometimes dealing with your IT department can be a draconian exercise. Uh, I TAC helps you avoid that. Uh, we don't need I, the IT team to stand up any infrastructure. It's just an app. Like you can get started with just an app, right? So you can go from crawl to walk pretty quickly and get up and running without having to go through an IT rigmarole. Uh, at least off out of the gate. And a lot of times that's a barrier to some of these other applications is. Oh gosh, we got to get IT involved and then it becomes a process. Yeah, we're leaning in the pitch with tax server. So <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I, I call it sometimes the IT departments of your dreams go to die. <laughs> and I, I'm I don't have that. I am blessed. I really do, but I'm also not the federal government, Chris. So <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think I think uh, that's uh, the beauty of TAC. Uh, and uh, it, you know, now we have uh, the support of our IT department. Uh, they're just overtasked, but we were able to do this on our own. Like Rick said, you don't need IT to do this. And, uh, I, you know, I think it, what it, AJ said was spot on. Uh, in my case, um, you know, a county this large, there's only three of us sworn uh, that that um, run uh, search incidents uh, or search and rescue incidents. Uh, we rely on volunteers. And we don't hand them phones. And uh, again, uh, it, what AJ pointed out, maybe you start with the team. So in my case, I was very lucky early on. I had my mountain rescue team, my, my tech uh, rescue experts that happened to all be Android users. And they were super excited about it. Uh, we just, just talk about the, the problem. And then slowly build out from there. Let, let people have their wins. Let them see it. And then you know the next guy goes, Hey, that, 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 how do I get in on that? And on our patrol side, we kind of did the same thing. There was there were some guys coming out of the military who understood the value of that. Some sergeants who say, hey, let's get our squad on it. We didn't ram it down anyone. So uh, to slowly build on that. And then and then the you know, lieutenants and people higher up go, oh, you can see where your people are? Or and then uh, even better, uh, mutual aid calls. I we, we, the fire departments love coming over to look at our tablets and uh, same with our personnel because oftentimes they embed them with us or we're, we're embedded with them. So uh, definitely start small and, and you know, it's like basic change management, you know, uh, target the people with influence and if they buy into it, they can build, build that out uh, both, uh, you know, laterally and then upwards uh, to uh, management. Starting small seems to be a nice theme. Nice. And so uh, I got to see, uh, we had Colin, uh, uh, Graham and Alex Gorsuch all raised their hand a different way. So we'll go Colin, Graham, Alex, and if we still have time, we'll do more. Um, but yeah, quick question. We'll kind of quick rapid fire. Let's if you, feel free to drop off whenever you need to, um, but let's kind of keep these responses now a little bit faster. Never 10, 15 minutes or so and drop off when you need. So we'll go Colin, Graham, Alex, Colin. Yes, sir. So, um, you know, we're, we're just kind of, my EMC asked me to explore TAC. And uh, I'm in a bit of a weird place because I am a regional radio system manager. And so because I don't, even though I am employed by a single county, we co-opt uh, all of the several counties into building the system. So I manage all the counties on the radio side. So 
that everyone sees me as, uh, hey, your IT department said no for something that could benefit everyone. Go to Colin. Um, <laughs> so uh, the wolf. Yeah, because I I get because I answer to three judges instead of two uh, one. I basically, uh, I you know, if I can say, hey, we need this for public safety, I can more or less get away from it, get away with it, and get it. Um, you know, and we're kind of we're looking at it for fire season as our implementations. Uh, you know, I would, I, you know, I, I have this great VHF P25 trunk system that I can leverage and, you know, Motorola is killing me right now because m a lot of our departments are starting to look at the next generation with the next radios and, you know, the next will run ta ATAC, but Motorola only will open that up to uh, uh, federal customers. Um, and they said, well, if we get enough use cases on, on the, uh, public safety side, we'll, we'll consider it. And I'm like, well, I can get you a bunch of use cases, um, especially with it becoming very popular on the fire side. So I guess my question, you know, you know, we're, we're just kind of, you know, I've got decent cell coverage, but it's a case of, you know, 90% of my public safety first responders out here are on frontline and then, a couple of them have, uh, you know, their all their cell phones are frontline, and they might have uh, first net hotspots. So I'm certainly looking for that alternate, and I would love to use the radio system as a as a backbone for data. But again, our other big problem is everyone runs iPhones, so you know, using plugins is not a valid uh, method for us. So I can make a comment on the, uh, Colin, are you using bring your own devices? Cause that's something that is that, you know, uh, you know, Paul deals with, I mean, he, he's got this volunteer militia of, of people that come to help on these search and rescue missions. And that's been a pain point for him is, you know, it's a lot of the bring your own device environment. So Colin, are you in the, the bring your own device world as well is this well um so or? no well this is mostly so we're a mix we're we're for the most part, part all esds but uh we only have a handful of full-time departments um so it's it, there's a mix of some bring your own but almost everyone has you know at some level of the county whether that's the fire or the sheriff's office um has county issued devices okay so um, perfect but, that, that, that's usually the biggest hurdle, right? Is so when those devices are ready to get, to get, um, get replaced, go buy an Android. It's as simple as that. Look, I, I, iTac has its place, but if you are if for bring your own device, but if you can get to the point to move to Android, that is my opinion, watching the, the, the last six years, if you really want to do all the things, um, move to the Android platform. But it sounds like the problem you're having, Colin, is more, you know, if there's no front line, even if you had an iPhone, uh, an Android phone, uh, if there's no front line, then what? Right. If there's no self-service, then what? Right. That's, yes, sir. That, that's my concern, because we'll get yeah. into these areas, especially by the lakes where, uh, you know, we, we, we start running into coverage issues. And even if in the right spots, we might even have portable radio coverage issues, too. But yeah. uh, for the most part, we've gotten most of that resolved now. But, you know, there's still a couple of spots where we have some special things going on there. Yeah. If you've got the VHF channels, I mean, if, if you have the, the VHF spectrum, you could look at Gotenna as 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 an as a way um, to do that. But yeah, yeah I mean, I've got part 22 frequencies for VHF, so I can do that. And I, I think uh, you started, you know, also keep in mind, ITAC is um, we run into that uh, typically uh, two thirds of our volunteer forces. Uh, um, uses iPhones and uh, a third or uh, use ATAC. Um, and so um, some vendors, depending on, you know, again, you gotta look at it. In the case of somewhere, for example, we bridge that, uh, yeah, you know, there's no plugin for ITAC, but they can use the, the commercial app and uh, it's not as ATAC, but it can, um, we definitely can send messages when there's absolutely no cell phone service, no, no we're in a radio dead spot. Uh, we can send markers, you know, that's 90% of the battle there. So there are some options out there. And I do hear that as ITAC is gaining more use, you know, maybe, maybe these vendors are going to start looking in, looking into that, but, you know, we've got to keep in mind, ATAC's had a, at least a 10 year head start um, as well. 
Wonderful. Let's keep it going around the horn. I know uh, Graham, you had raised your hand and then Alex Gorsuch. So Graham, uh, quick thoughts. Who are you? And then uh, throw it around. Yeah. Hi, guys. Um, I'm uh, from Sydney, Australia, 40 years uh, fire service experience over here, recently retired, now working for a vendor and that vendor is Haifa. So we uh, we manufacture the Haifa mesh product uh, and we're really keen on uh, now pushing uh, with all with all the experience I've got in fire, urban search and rescue, et cetera. I can see a real uh, need to for vendors to get involved in this space and to start to integrate TAC into uh, a lot of their offerings. So that's what we're we're really keen to now uh, get involved as a vendor and work work with agencies as much as we can. We're looking for uh, people who can uh, stick their hand up and say, "Hey, we're willing to uh, to partner as an agency, and we'll, we'll partner with you guys as well to to utilize the mesh." Obviously, uh, our mesh product in four point nine is a real beneficial uh, add-on uh, to help uh, enable you guys using TAC out in the field. Uh, we're also doing a lot of stuff uh, with vehicles as a node, enabling uh, vehicles with uh, things like Starlink and other uh, cell services running the TAC server locally on the devices or uh, in disconnected mode. So we're really keen to um, to get into this space. Australia uh, is a bit of a wilderness as far as TAC is concerned. After uh, 47 years as a volunteer as well in the fire service, I'd never heard of TAC until I joined up with Haifa. So it's uh, for us, it's a bit of a, an eye-opening experience to try and get this into the uh, into the emergency services in Australia and um, obviously support uh, you guys in the US as well. So um, you're really keen to um, to get more into this space and, as I say, yeah, uh, to support that with uh, some of the product offerings. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to, uh, to working with some of you guys. Well, I, Graham, I, uh, I got a we got a tax server set up running for South Australia Country Fire Service right now. They're using it. I'm not sure if you're in contact with those folks, but I can get you in contact with them. Yeah, I've got uh, Dave's contact details right. in South Australia. Um, Perfect. We've also uh, just stood up our own tax server. We're in the process of standing up our own tax server to uh, provide that as a service for some of our Australian customers, and uh, just on a real steep learning curve for myself and my colleague Matt, who's also on this call. Um, to uh, to get ourselves up to speed on on, on TAC, but uh, I uh, I helped set up a dashi in uh, in New South Wales in Australia here that, that that's rolled out pretty widely. So obviously I'm familiar in the space, but I can see a real a real gap in the market and a real use case in the tax space. So uh, yeah, very very keen to progress. Love it. Good knowledge, Sharon. Uh, Alex Bursak, throw it to you. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Kevin. Um, so I'm driving right now. So sorry if my audio quality ain't great. Um, cool. So I have two quick stories that I want to share. Um, first, background on myself. Um, so uh, work at Ascent Integrated Tech. We do indoor tracking and stuff. Uh, been working on it for about three years. Um, I've been aware of TAC for around that time. Um, and uh, I want to share two stories from the technologist side. Uh, that point to, in my opinion, the great power of TAC and why uh, I do agree that there should be multiple cops. It really is the one cop to rule them all. Uh, so this morning I was at um, Indianapolis FD training tower doing a technical demonstration with Red Lab, who ran the first challenge. Uh, and the Red Lab server was down. Um, sorry, AJ. Uh, but I was able to very quickly get Dale over there at Indy Fire um, onto our TAC server and get all of my configs, et cetera, loaded onto his tablet um, with just a few quick QR code snips. So it was very, very fast, very, very easy to get him connected and spun up and deliver a quick different experience than native vanilla TAC, uh, because vanilla TAC is really more intended for the strategic layer of war and the tactical. It needs some changes. Um, the other story is I was in Prague on Monday um, doing a demo and presenting TAC to the NATO crash fire rescue panel. Um, and for them, the big selling point of TAC was not the inherent technical capabilities, you know, the interface, some of the cool things. Um, it was just to the fact that TAC is a quite literally battle-tested and proven architecture for data sharing and transmission and display. And as a company that generates data, for us to be able to take it off the plate and deliver best in class data transmission and data display to mission partners makes all the difference. 
and allow us to truly solve the mission. Whereas if we try and do everything as an industry, if we try and do everything, we try and build the cop, we try and you know provide every single solution, the vendor might win, but the first responder is going to fail. And I care a lot more about the first responder, the user, the actual mission need being solved than I do about anything else. I see Dale Wilson here. Um, Dale, do you want to add on to anything Alex said? Very simple for what um, Alex was able to do to get us up and running. Nice. uh, Just connecting multiple servers. And um, I was impressed with how it worked. We have a recruit class of 66 firefighters right now in um, a couple of different units, uh, burn Built burn structure, conics boxes, and uh, a training tower. Um, uh, we did multiple drills and with different firefighters. They didn't have a problem with the device; they just shoved it in their pocket, and and it seemed to track very well for us. So, um, interested to go through the data and and see how the tracks laid out and and the floor plans that uh, were. Uh, uh, put on there by the eyesight team uh, made a difference in you know just seeing where the firefighters or the recruits were at so it was a good good experience and i thank alex for coming down again and, and helping us out yeah alex you got to tell me when the server's not working i can't fix it then we have we've had having some tax server a little hiccups on some deployments five by five as well so good to know and you mentioned that that Dale on the eyesight thing. David Cogastell is on here. Um, he's got a program that he's building called eyesight uh, that is building, bringing floor plans in, in into TAC. And it really, um, it really adds context to buildings. You know, we, we've been using CRG and when I met David bringing the eyesight maps in, they're just as good. There was a question on here. Anybody been using this for active shooter? Um, and so the, the, the mapping of, of large campuses and buildings huge, and it's not just an active shooter. It could be, you know, even just a medical emergency in a large campus or, a, you know, a building, a school. So nice to have the floor plans just immediately. And then before I used to take kind of a picture from the fire engine of what the building looked like. Well, now I just have it on my phone as I'm walking throughout the building. It's, it's nice. I want to leave a closing thought on what Bram and Alex said. Um, these are both vendors who are integrating with TAC, right? They've seen the writing on the wall around TAC. Um, if we look at the legacy of interoperability and how it's affected first responders so far, uh, take APCO 25 as your first example. APCO 25 was supposed to make it so that I could take my radio anywhere and use it. And what that means now is I can take my APCO 25 radio to another jurisdiction and they too will give me their APCO 25 radio. Right. So we really haven't solved for much there. Um, If we looked at the tragedy that led to the formation of FirstNet, what it gave us was a universal interoperable cellular network. Um, All of these came down from the top down. Right. These were these came out of committees and joint organizations and standards organizations putting this together and pushing it onto us as the first responders to use. For better or worse, we're using some of these things and sometimes they work. What TAC represents for us as first responders is that we have the de facto situational awareness standard today with TAC. Right. We're using it today. We're defining it today and we're deploying it today. And we don't need to wait for a standards body or a non-government organization to come together and define for us what we think we need. It's the person downrange, it's the person in the field who knows what it is that they need, and we're putting the data in their hands today. Well said on all fronts. Um, So we are approaching the 15 minutes past the hour. Uh, We still got 47 people here, so we'll keep this rolling for a bit longer. Um, I, see a couple other people off camera, whether it's uh, Dallas or David um, and anyone else, anyone else want to raise their virtual hand and everyone, if you got to leave, leave, um, but want to leave this, you know, quick 30 seconds, quick little rapid fire comments, questions, Dallas or David or anyone else want to say anything? Hi, Kevin. Are you referring to me when you say David? David, David Cogshell. There's several Davids on the call. Uh, yeah, I just uh, 
would suggest that anybody that's act, uh, interested in the indoor floor plan work that we're doing, uh, not just for active shooter, that just happens to be a, a very special case where TAC could be incredible. Um, you're not trying to find a downed firefighter, you're trying to locate a, a, a shooter inside a building and where your resources, your SWAT team is outside the building, but also you can then potentially uh, bring in the CCTV cameras that are looking down the halls and so forth and marry them together. So maybe folks could get in touch with Kevin if they're interested in the indoor floor plan work that we're doing. Uh, and uh, uh, maybe we'll have a session on that someday. Thanks. Thanks, David. And just, just in the meantime, the waking moments, I'm, I'm sharing the screen for the, um, for the CivTac 24, and there's also the TAC offsite. That's a little obviously different, um, but yeah, definitely make sure to reach out to Ken Rabin and, and learning about all things um, what the IU Red Lab is doing and Griffiths Institute. Um, but I believe there was one other person whose uh, camera was off. Dallas Sims, did you want to say anything, comment, question in the final moments here? Kevin, I don't really have anything specific that I was looking for. I'm, I'm, creating a new dispatch center and looking at this of more of an EOC uh, platform or uh, basis to be able to track a bunch of volunteer departments. So this, I'm looking at the radios that we have being able to pull their GPS data out of them. We just got a new, a whole new set of radios throughout the county. So I was looking to see if this was a viable option for that. Yes, uh, there are agencies doing that today. Uh, we have folks doing it both on the uh, on the non public safety radio system side. People are doing it with turbo systems and and systems like that, and then on the P twenty five side, pulling that off. The constraint there is if you're not already running positioning on your radio system today, right? If you haven't freed up a time slot for positioning, you've got to kind of start with that because TAC isn't going to be is going to magically show that up, right? You've got to enable that first. The flip side, though, is that if your responders have phones already, well, we could just utilize the phone. We don't necessarily have to go and modify the radio system to do that. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. I, I'm not looking to, I don't think, hook up everyone's cell phone because then I've got, uh, I'm tracking a lot of people that I don't think want to be tracked when they're not on duty. But uh, I, I think the new radio system that we're moving to, we can integrate all of that and try to set that all up at once. For sure. You know, and it's interesting that you mentioned that not tracking them when they're off duty. Obviously, that's a personal concern. Sometimes that's a union concern. And I've started including that in my briefings when we're when we're spinning people up uh, on tack. I say, hey, look, at the end of your shift, just close it. Right. I realize that's, you know, you don't want to be tracked. But during your shift, hey, if you're down, we need to get get help to the X ASAP. But I understand when you go home, you go home. Here's how you close the app. Right. And that usually relieves people's fears for the most part. Like, I don't care if you're on a bathroom break, man. I do care if your car crashes. I'd rather, I don't, I want to get there. And if I don't have your position, we can't get there. But obviously that's going to depend agency to agency, how you, how you make that pitch. Well said. Uh, Kim, Chief Z, Kim. Hey, I, I, last conversation I actually get because, you know, tracking on phone just as easy as picking an app and them being able to decide whether it's on or off, you know, turn it on or off, be tracked is, is simple. And I think that, you know, from simple to complex, from, you know, doing it on the cheap side to being very expensive, you know, um, AJ will share with you is that you have the ability to, to pick how you want to do it and what you want to do. And, you know, at the very least, if you're not sure, start out on some easy app and, 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 and gradually work your way in. Um, and, and, and get to learn the, the product and the capabilities. And I think more than anything is that, you know, whether you use TAC or, or something else, I think the other side of it is that we want integration and we want to be able to share across multiple platforms. And I think that's really the key to you know, what we do and how we do it. And, um, you know, again, we want people in the business that they're, they're going to be in here in the business to share and, um, and and be able to provide something that's real time and that's effective for the folks that are, that are onboarding it. Well, thanks, Chief Z. Any, um, 
I was going to say, Chief, you've seen my presentations, you know, at the end when I bring that silver bullet up, right? And I, the next click of the slide is all the other applications that are out there, right? And we do, do, we do need to identify what are the key elements that we can share across systems. And that's typically not a technical problem. Greg right here will take a metric bolt and a standard nut and give you banana bread by midnight, as he says. He'll take the systems. What We don't have a technology problem. We really have, it, it's typically a person problem. People problems at whatever agency they don't want to share. And that is tough. You know, it's typically not tough. Cool. Concur. So we're, we're running a little past here. So I want to now just send to say final um, Greg, AJ, Paul, final mic drop moments or, or I've put your LinkedIn's in the chat. I'm sure people are connecting with you. Final comments, AJ, Paul, Greg, that you could leave us with here today. And I'm also going to simultaneously share the Civ tax screen. Um, so we'll throw it to. I'll, I'll go. Uh, be brave enough to suck at something new. TAC isn't easy to start. It's You're going to have to learn it. And I don't know why this is so different in the fire service. Everything we do requires reps to master. But with technology, for some reason, people do not want to put the time in. Um, the, you, everybody's heard the 10,000 hour rule. Okay. Um, if my agency can do it, anybody can do it. Well said. Paul. Yeah, I, you know, when it comes to, you know, TAC not being a silver bullet, I concur with that completely. It's uh, we have multiple things going on, but uh, what I urge you folks to think is uh, uh, the nice thing about uh, TAC and interoperability is that that end user only has to learn that one device. It's it's the support that we give them. Uh, how, how do we get that data to them instead of them having to go out there and have to run 10 different apps and so forth, try, let's try to take the burden off our rescuers and um, and uh, take that challenge on to figure out how we not get not only get stuff in the tech but also out of time. So. And to wrap us up here, Greg, you're gonna. I want everyone to get a sheet of paper and write down on the sheet of paper why didn't I try this sooner, and then fold that up and put it in your pocket. And then in a couple months, once you've started using TAC, you'll pull that out, and I guarantee you'll repeat that sentence. Why didn't we start using this sooner? And I only say that because. I've heard people say that to me multiple times. Why didn't we try? Why didn't we start using this sooner? Don't wait for the tragedy to be the the reasoning to do that. Very late than never, man, and no time like the present. So well said on all fronts. Um, again, I'm going to share this screen one last time. Be on the lookout for CivTAC um, 2024 um, in collaboration with Red Lab, who's kind of served in as a Swiss Army knife here organized with CritCom and Ken, Criffis Institute and Smart Firefighting. So make sure to have that on your radar. Also, if you are going to be in Chicago next week for the 5x5, five five, we're having a CivTAC after hours event. Make sure to connect with me. Um, it's Tuesday night, uh, hosted at the Ascent office. A lot of TAC members are going to be there. So if you're in Chicago, let me know. We'll be doing these once a month for the remainder of the year in partnership with Red Lab. Um, to just continue to talk about all things TAC. As you know, as you can see, there's a lot to unpack here. Um, but you've got, you're not alone, you know, as AJ and Paul said, like, you're going to suck at this and everyone sucks at what they first start doing, but um, got to start somewhere um, and you're not alone. So thank you all very much for your time today. Special shout out. Thank you to AJ, Paul and Greg. Um, just appreciate you guys and um, hope you all have a great Friday, great safe weekend and um, look forward to connecting with you all again soon. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks all. Thanks, guys. Till next time. Thank you, everyone. All right, I'm closing out. Happy Friday.